Our scripture reading this morning is Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. That reading can be found on page 980 in your pew Bible or the Bible on your chair. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Would you join with me in prayer? Our Father, the Scriptures say about themselves that they are the Word of Christ. And so we need to hear the voice of Christ from the Word of Christ on this Resurrection Sunday morning. Thank you for causing your Son to be raised from the dead. Now, please give resurrection life to those who are dead in their trespasses and sins and continue the saving work you've begun and those of us who've believed on your, on your son. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a storytelling element that you've encountered countless times in fiction and in real life. Before victory and glory comes suffering and pain. Before the United States could lead the Allies to experience victory in Europe Day and victory in Japan Day came Pearl Harbor. Before the 1980 U.S. Olympic hockey team could beat the Soviets over in Lake Placid to advance to the gold medal game, Herb Brooks has them skating until their legs fall off. Before Luke Skywalker... can lead the Rebel Alliance to defeat the Empire and their Death Star. He's alone with Yoda, learning how to harness the Force in swampy Java. What's my point? Before victory and glory comes suffering and pain. Indeed, victory and glory in many a story we love come because of suffering and pain. Throughout our Easter sermon series last Sunday on Palm Sunday, then this past Thursday on Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, and now today, Easter Sunday, we've been considering how the Lord Jesus Christ is the last king you'd expect. While he is, as the Bible says, we just heard, he's highly exalted, his path to that highest exaltation is the last path you'd expect for a king. For Jesus, before exaltation and glory, there was suffering and death. Now I want to ask you, what does Jesus' exaltation and glory because of his suffering death and death have to do with any of you? Every one of you comes here today with suffering of one kind or another or of lots of different kinds. Some of you are suffering because of your own sin. Some of you are suffering because of the sins of others. Some of you are suffering because of sickness or strained relationships. Some of you are suffering because of hard circumstances, financial, having to do with employment, of many different kinds. 
And so I want to say to you that Jesus' path to glory will give you hope amid your suffering if you have ears to hear it. Do you want to know how it is that your suffering and even your eventual death can be redeemed and turn out to be the way for your resurrection and glory? Do you want to know how Jesus' suffering and death makes the way for you? Well, as we begin answering those questions from the Scriptures, take your Bibles, please, and turn with me to the New Testament book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. In the sermon outline that you have in your bulletin, you'll find that the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, is found on page 884. We invite you to use one of the Bibles that are in the pew rack or that's available in the fellowship hall, and if you don't have a Bible of your own, you are warmly invited to take that Bible to have as your own as our gift to you. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. And in this chapter, we see the necessity of Jesus' suffering and death, this unexpected path to glory, stated clearly for us. On the first Resurrection Sunday, just hours after Jesus had been raised from the dead, the women who arrived early in the morning to anoint Jesus' corpse, as they expected, with fragrant spices and ointments, were greeted at the empty tomb, the Bible tells us, by two angels. Luke, here in Luke chapter 24 and verse 5, records those angels saying to the women, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man, notice, must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. Later on in that same chapter, Luke 24, on the very same day, the first Easter Sunday, just hours again after his resurrection from the dead, Jesus is now speaking to two of his followers who as yet didn't understand that the Savior of God's people would have to suffer and die and be resurrected. And in Luke chapter 24, down in verse 26, notice what Jesus says to these two followers of his. O foolish ones, verse 25 rather, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? So we've got two angels sent by God to herald the news of Jesus' resurrection. Then we've got the resurrected Jesus himself telling us that his suffering and death were necessary before he entered into his glory. And that raises the question as we see the necessity of Jesus' suffering and death demonstrated. It raises the question, why? Why was it necessary? As the scriptures plainly say that it was. For Jesus to suffer and die before entering into his glory. Why is the inescapable path to glory for the Son of God, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, a path that takes him through suffering and death? Well, the first reason Scripture gives us is because this is fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Recall what we've just seen Jesus saying to the two disciples with whom he speaks on the first Resurrection Sunday. Remember, he said, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Jesus says that the prophets, the Old Testament prophets, foretell the Christ's suffering prior to his entrance into glory. Look down at verse 44 of this same chapter, Luke 24. Jesus is now gathered with his disciples. He says to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. It's the same thing he's been saying earlier when he said these things must happen, when he says these things are necessary. It's the very same idea. Then he opened their minds, verse 45, to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. 
The whole Old Testament, the law, the prophets, the writings are saying that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. And so we see from the scriptures that Jesus' suffering and death en route to his resurrection and glory were necessary if the scriptures would be fulfilled. Jesus says, everything written about me must be fulfilled. So his necessity of suffering and death is demonstrated by fulfillment. It's also demonstrated in his temptations. Turn left from the Gospel of Luke and turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4. This is the first book in the New Testament. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4. And follow along with me, please, as I read verses 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, had set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And He said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Notice the three ways that Satan tempts Jesus. First, Satan tempts Jesus to supernaturally provide food for himself by turning stones into bread. What a temptation this must have been. Jesus was hungry. He'd fasted 40 days and 40 nights, but Jesus knew that the Father's will was not to provide for his son in the way that Satan was presenting. The food that Jesus knew he needed was to do his Father's will. John chapter 4, Jesus says, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. That's my food, Jesus says. And what was the will of the Father who sent Jesus the Son? His will was for Jesus to render perfect obedience to God's law and then to die on the cross as the atoning, sin-bearing, wrath-absorbing sacrifice for the salvation and eternal life of all of his people. The father did not will to provide for his son in the way that Satan is tempting. To miraculously provide food for himself would have been for Jesus to push the eject button on the road of suffering that the father willed his son to walk on his way to the cross. Notice second, Satan tempts Jesus to throw himself off the roof, the pinnacle of the temple in Jerusalem. The devil pulls a new card out of his sleeve. This time he quotes Bible verses to Jesus. He quotes Psalm 91, 11, and 12. He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. But Jesus knows this isn't the Father's will. Jesus knows that his deliverance from harm is to come only one way, from being raised from the dead on the third day after suffering and dying on the cross. Third, notice that Satan tempts Jesus with all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he says he'll give it all to Jesus if Jesus will fall down and worship him. Thankfully for us, because we'd have no hope of salvation, no hope of eternal life had Jesus succumbed to Satan's temptations. Thankfully, Jesus resisted this one too. 
Jesus knew that the path to his receiving all authority in heaven and on earth, the path to having all of his enemies put under his feet, was the cross, and only the cross and the empty tomb. Why am I pointing out these temptations? It's because what Satan is doing is tempting Jesus to receive his provision, to receive rescue, to receive glory by going around the cross. But Jesus resists Satan at every turn with the truth of the word of God because Jesus knows that there is no provision for him. There is no rescue. There is no power and authority and glory for him except by way of his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. Jesus demonstrates in his resistance of Satan's temptations that his path to resurrection and glory is inescapably the path of suffering and death, and it must be to fulfill the scriptures. It also must be this way for his enthronement. The scriptures make abundantly clear that before Jesus could wear the victor's crown, he first had to suffer on the sinner's cross. The passage our brother Ryan read for us earlier from Philippians 2 make this connection explicit. Listen again to a portion of what he read. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, Paul's saying, as a result of his becoming obedient to the point of death on a cross, therefore, God has highly exalted him and has bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But that only happened. His high exaltation happened because he became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Paul opens his letter to the Romans by talking about the gospel of God's Son, who he says was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by, as a result of, his resurrection from the dead. Jesus being declared the Son of God in power, that's enthronement language. For Jesus to be declared the Son of God in power is for Jesus to be declared King of God's people. And how is it that Paul says to the Romans that Jesus came to be declared the Son of God in power? How is it that he came to be enthroned by his resurrection from the dead? I hope you're seeing it. No suffering and death, no resurrection, no resurrection, no enthronement for Jesus. The writer of Hebrews says, in Hebrews chapter 2, that Jesus' suffering and death were inescapably, inextricably linked to his enthronement. In Hebrews 2, he writes, But we see him, speaking of Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. The writer of Hebrews says it was appropriate, it was fitting according to God's unsearchable wisdom that the Father make the founder of our salvation, Jesus Christ, perfect through suffering. Now, don't hear about Jesus being made perfect and think that he was ever somehow imperfect. He was always perfectly sinless. His, perfect, his being made perfect wasn't about some imperfection, but rather about something that was incomplete. Jesus couldn't be enthroned at the Father's right hand until he had suffered on the cross. There was a crown for Jesus to wear. There was a throne for him to occupy, but he wasn't fit to wear the crown 
or to rule from that throne until he had rendered perfect obedience, culminating with his offering himself as the wrath-satisfying substitute for the sins of his people at the cross and being raised from the dead three days later. That's what's meant by Jesus being made perfect. Before the cross and the resurrection, his report card would have had an incomplete on it had he never gone to the cross and been raised from the dead. We're talking about the necessity of the king's inescapable, unexpected path to glory, a path of suffering and death. We get how Jesus, the Son of God, we get why the Bible calls him King of Kings and Lord of Lords, but that necessary path to that exaltation, being suffering and death, is part of what makes him the last king you'd expect. But listen, as Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, a disciple is not above his master, or rather a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. That means, brothers and sisters in Christ, that if Jesus had to walk the path of suffering and death before his resurrection in glory, so too must we who have faith in him. If we would experience resurrection and glory in him, we must first endure suffering and death. The Bible says as much in places like Romans chapter 8. Listen to verses 16 and 17 of that chapter. The Spirit himself bears with the Spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Do you hear that? Paul says, we who believe will be fellow heirs with Christ. He's going to share with us his inheritance from the Father, eternal resurrection life in the new heavens and new earth, communion with God and all of the rest. We will be joint heirs with Christ if we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. During Paul and Barnabas' first missionary journey in Acts chapter 14, they told the believers in Lystra and Iconium and Antioch that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Why is it that we suffer and die before glory? Why is it that the Lord Jesus did? Maybe you're wondering why there's suffering and, uh, suffering and death in the first place. Well, the Bible answers that question for us. Way back in the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis that we're preaching through here at our church right now, in Genesis chapter 3, we see what is the root of all human suffering. All human suffering, and by extension, the suffering that the rest of creation experiences. The root of that is sin. In Genesis chapter 3, the Bible says that Satan, the devil, having taken the form of a snake, comes into the Garden of Eden and tempts the first two people God created, Adam and Eve. And Satan tempts them to break God's command not to eat fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Adam and Eve, unlike the Lord Jesus Christ, succumb to Satan's temptation. And from there, the curse of sin is unleashed by God on all humanity and on all creation. And it's the kind of curse that only gets broken from the inside out. Paul would write to the Galatians that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Just as it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that through Jesus Christ, all the promises of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, namely the promised Holy Spirit by faith. We've seen that the Bible states that the king's people, Christians, have to walk the path of suffering and death before our resurrection and glory, just like our Lord. Let's look at a couple of passages that flesh that out. If your Bible's still open to the Gospel of Matthew, turn right 
past Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts, and go with me to the book of Romans, chapter 6. The book of Romans, chapter 6. I'm going to read the first five verses of Romans chapter 6. Paul writes, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Paul is saying to us that our suffering and death, brothers and sisters in Christ, leads to our resurrection and glory, not because our own suffering and our own death actually accomplish anything for us, but rather because we've been united to Christ. And so his death to sin on the cross was our death to sin on the cross because the Father has placed us in him and has united us to him. Jesus' resurrection to new life has already begun to be experienced by us as we now walk in newness of life, as we walk in victory over sin slavery, as we walk in growing in grace and in new affections toward God and Christ and toward his people. And the resurrection from the dead that Jesus experienced bodily that we remember today, that's going to be our resurrection too. When he returns, Paul says, for if we've been united with him in a death like his, his death to sin, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Paul says something similar in 1 Corinthians 15. He says in verse 20 of that chapter, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of all who have fallen asleep. First fruits is an agricultural term. It means the first part of a harvest. Whatever the first fruits of a harvest is, well, that's what the rest of the harvest is going to be. Whether you're harvesting Macintosh apples or pumpkins or corn, that's what the rest of the harvest is going to be. Apples or pumpkins or corn or whatever else. And Paul says that Jesus' resurrection is the first fruits of all who die with faith in Christ. And here's the upshot of all that I'm saying. Listen closely. Whatever Jesus' resurrection was, and it was a bodily resurrection to glory after suffering and death, the Bible's saying that's what his people's will be as well. A bodily resurrection to glory after suffering and death. And just as Jesus' death led to a resurrection to enthronement, so too, brothers and sisters, will ours, because the Father has united us to the Son. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul gives us a, a sort of mini-Christian confession. He writes, if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Did you hear what Paul said? If we endure, if we endure in faith, if we endure in faith through suffering and death, if we endure, we will also reign with him. I read to you earlier Romans 8, 16 and 17. Let me read it again and this time keep going. Paul writes, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. 
then he says, and not creation only, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Do you hear it? Here's the takeaway, brothers and sisters. Sufferings of this present time, as they did for Jesus, because we're united to him by faith, sufferings of this present time will give way to a glory that these sufferings aren't even worth comparing to. Paul says something marvelous in 2 Corinthians. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away. Sometimes just getting out of bed reminds you of that. Your outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed day by day for this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. This same apostle would chronicle his sufferings for the gospel's sake later in this same book, 2 Corinthians. Listen, Paul writes, Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there's the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. And yet this apostle says to us in this same book that this light, momentary affliction is an eternal weight of glory. On the other side of it, it's preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Even more so, the Lord Jesus You can't begin to chronicle his suffering. And it began long before the cross. He suffered the, the humble condescension as the creator becoming creation, becoming a man, subjecting himself to hunger and thirst, to fatigue to pain and sorrow, to rejection, to betrayal, to denial, yes, even to death, death on a cross, and not a death like you or I could ever experience, a death during which he drank the bitter cup of God's righteous wrath against sin until that cup was dry. And the Lord Jesus, for the joy set before him, the writer of Hebrews says, endured the cross. Jesus says to us from his word, on the other side now, in resurrection glorified, he says to us who believe, on the other side of your light, momentary affliction too, is an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. It has to be said in this conversation, dear believer, that your suffering and even your death are not because God's wrath remains on you. You continue to experience suffering and death because while the curse of sin has already begun to be broken for believers, its final breaking is yet to come at Christ's return. But you don't suffer as punishment for your sin you got to get that straight in your heads, that Christ bore all your punishment for all your sins in his body on the cross. You suffer because, as Hebrews 13 says, the Father disciplines those he loves. Because God has saved you, you who are in Christ, 
your suffering is now redemptive. It's an instrument in God's redeeming hands, masterfully shaping you and forming you into his son's beautiful image. Your suffering is redeemed by your loving father so that it now yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. As the hymn says, now your suffering sanctifies to you. God uses it to sanctify to you your deepest distress because he uses his sufferings to con- your sufferings to conform you to the image of his son on your path to resurrection and glory in Christ. Jesus suffered all of the Father's just, fair, righteous wrath against your sin believer. Jesus suffered it. You don't. Your suffering could never have earned you anything before the Father. Your suffering merits you nothing pertaining to salvation. It's the Lord's suffering and death and his resurrection that has gained you everything, everything. Life, forgiveness, cleansing, reconciliation with God and his people, the hope of glory, the hope of dwelling face to face with God in Christ eternally, and the new heavens and new earth wherein dwells only righteousness. So how do we respond to the truths that we've heard from the scriptures on this Resurrection Sunday morning? Well, I want to say to you who are not Christians, I'm so grateful that you're here. You are welcome every time we meet. But I want to say to you that the only way your suffering and death can lead to resurrection and glory is if you will obey Jesus' command to repent and believe the gospel. The gospel of Mark tells us that that's what Jesus went about saying. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. What does it mean to repent? It means to recognize that you are a sinner. That you do not obey God's commands perfectly as he says you must that you do not love him with all your heart and soul and mind and strength as his Bible says you must and as he's worthy of. And you're not alone. Every one of us in this room was born into the very same sin that you experience and commit and are stained by. Therefore, to repent means to recognize that you're a sinner. And to leave your sinful life behind to be a follower of Jesus Christ. To repent means to turn from your sin and turn to Christ for rescue from death and hell and the grave. You who are not Christian, I want to say to you, it's not as though there's a path that doesn't involve suffering and death for you. Yes, to follow Christ might mean suffering that you wouldn't otherwise have experienced. But there is an an option available to any person to live a life free of suffering and death. I don't need to remind any of you of that. And so then what lays before each of you is this question. Will you have resurrection and glory at the end of your suffering and death? Or will you have eternal suffering and death at the end of your suffering and death in this life? Those are your options. If you will obey Jesus' command to repent and believe the gospel, when you die, or at his return, whichever comes first, your body, whether you're alive or whether you're in the grave, is going to be immediately transformed into a glorious resurrection body, just like Jesus' own glorious resurrection body. And you'll live forever with him and all his people, reigning as his co-regents in a restored, renewed creation. The new heavens and the new earth. It'll be paradise, entirely free from sin and from any of sin's wicked, cursed effects. But if you will not repent and believe the gospel, if you will not turn from your sin and come to the Lord Jesus Christ for cleansing and for forgiveness, when you die... Or at his return, whichever comes first. The Bible teaches that you'll enter into an eternity 
of conscious torment. And it will be the fair payment toward God for your failure to turn from your sin and place your faith in his son and in him alone to save you from your sin and to cause you to have peace with God. I've said to you who are outside of Christ, repent and believe the gospel. When I call you to believe the gospel, I'm calling on you to believe good news. It is good news that Jesus suffered and died in the place of sinners just like you. It is good news that he now offers to you eternal life and salvation from sin and death and hell through the lips of this preacher. It is good news that the God whom you've rebelled against and sinned against and disobeyed and failed to love and worship as he deserves, it's good news that he willingly poured out all his righteous wrath against sinners like you onto his perfect sinless son when Jesus died on the cross. And he did it so that if you have faith in him, you will receive none of his wrath and will instead know only his love and his favor and his pleasure. If you will but Place your faith in his son and in his son alone to make you right with God. That's the gospel. That is good news. You will suffer in this life. Some of you have suffered greatly. Some of you are suffering greatly. Some of you will suffer greatly yet in ways you don't know. And I say to you who are outside of Christ, turn to the Lord Jesus. Repent and believe the gospel so that your suffering and death will have prepared for you an eternal weight of glory so that your sufferings in this life will not be able to be compared to the glory that awaits. Jesus says to every one of you who's not a Christian, he says it today and you ought to obey it today. Repent and believe the gospel. How do we, brothers and sisters, apply these truths to our lives? Well, first, I think we need to reset our expectations. When Peter writes 1 Peter, he writes to believers who are suffering things for their faith in Christ that we haven't yet suffered. And he writes to these persecuted believers, he says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Peter says to us, brothers and sisters, not to be surprised by suffering. That's really helpful if we'll obey that command. You're less likely to get your legs knocked out from under you by suffering when you expect it, when you're not surprised that it characterizes this life. Now, I'm not asking you to be some kind of pessimistic fatalist about suffering. Not at all. I'm just saying, don't be surprised by suffering as though something strange were happening to you. That's what Peter's saying. Jesus said to his disciples before he died, in this world you will have tribulations. But take heart, I've overcome the world. And then Peter says something astounding. But... Rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Rejoice in sufferings? Yes. Rejoice in sufferings. Why in the world would you do that, brother and sister? It's because your suffering and even your death are the signposts that you are on the road to resurrection and glory in Christ. Paul says we're heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So let your response to suffering be, yes, Lord. Let this suffering be for me the path to resurrection and glory with Christ. Brothers and sisters, when you remember what's at the end of your road of suffering and death, 
when you remember resurrection glory with Christ, God gives you grace to endure. Rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings so that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Suffering necessarily precedes glory. It did for Jesus, and it's going to for those who are in Jesus. I can't say it to you any better than our brother Charles Spurgeon said it. Hang in there with his Victorian English. My soul, what sayest thou? Art thou so vain as to hope to break through the heavenly rule? Dost thou hope for reward without labor? Or honor without toil? Dismiss the idle expectation and be content to take the ill-favored things for the sake of the sweet love of Jesus which will recompense thee for all. In such a spirit, laboring and suffering, thou wilt find that bitters grow sweet and hard things easy. Like Jacob, thy years of service will seem unto thee but a few days for the love thou hast to Jesus. And when the dear hour of the wedding feast shall come, all thy toils shall be as though they had never been. An hour with Jesus will make up for ages of pain and labor. I like how the hymn writer said it. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of him in glory will the toils of life repay. Second, brothers and sisters, respond to these truths today by hoping and longing for the end of suffering and death. One day, the last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, is going to finish the work that he's begun to undo the curse of sin that was placed on you by the first Adam. And on that day, when he returns, he's going to announce from his throne, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. That's what Jesus will announce at his return. And so pray for that day, brothers and sisters, the day of Jesus' return. Grow in your longing for it. When your thoughts wander, let them wander to Jesus' return and the end of suffering and death. When you wake up at night, let yourself fall back to sleep with thoughts of the Lord Jesus' return, setting your hope fully on the grace that's going to be brought to you when he's revealed. Let the hope of dwelling bodily with Christ forever under an eternal weight of glory be the soothing balm that you apply to all of the suffering of this life, suffering of any kind, Suffering of every kind. Yes, even the suffering of death. Our King, the Lord Jesus Christ, He's been highly exalted. He's been raised from the dead. He's been crowned with glory and honor because He faithfully and obediently walked the road of suffering and death. His crown and his throne came in the most unexpected of ways. And we who are in him will not arrive at resurrection and glory in him without suffering and death too. But because he's alive from the dead, we can face those things with hope that Jesus has overcome the grave and that suffering and death are not going to have the last word. The last word, brothers and sisters, is resurrection and glory in and through and with Christ forever. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We praise you for rescuing your son from death, for raising him from the dead, highly exalting him, glorifying him, and seating him at your right hand. Oh God, I pray that those who are outside of Christ 
will be raised from the dead spiritually, even today. And I pray that those of us whom you have given new life to will set our hope fully on the day when suffering and death will finally, eternally give way to resurrection and glory with Christ. We pray in his name. Amen.